Hello and welcome to episode 78 of the world's first Paul Weller fan podcast. I'm Dan Jennings and 10 years ago I gave up my live stream and career as a radio presenter with one big regret. Never getting to interview my hero, the legendary British musician Paul Weller. This podcast exists purely to solve that issue. Welcome to Desperately Seeking Paul. And in this episode I'm joined by Grammy Award winner, singer, songwriter, producer, one of the pioneers of UK soul music, Junior Giscom. We'll dig into some great Weller connections from the Council Collective and Red Wedge to joining the Style Council at Wembley and his own impressive back catalogue. Let's get into it. Junior, thanks for joining me. Hey, Dan. Thank you very much for asking me. Now, I have to say, you're one of those rare people in life, in music, where just the first name, we know who you are, my friend. You know, I, th- I was thinking about this. It's like, it's Kylie, Beyonce, Robbie and you. I can't think of any other examples to the point I don't even know how to pronounce your surname. It's, it's, like, it's amazing. <laughs> well, this is the thing you see, right? It's like when you when we started out and it was like I wanted the Giscom and the guy at the record company turned around and he, he just he touched me on the shoulder and he said to me like, Giscom, you're crazy, right? Who's going to remember Giscom and how to pronounce Giscom? Like, okay, Strictly Junior then. That's it. Just Junior. <laughs> oh, well, this is so lovely to have you on, my friend. I'm, I'm really pleased that you're here. I'm going to look forward to digging into some of the links with Mr. Weller, but also yeah. your amazing career as well. So, and this whole journey for you in music started like a properly young age. You worked out you could do this from like the age of dot, right? It's like, no. Nah. Yeah, pretty much. My mum and dad lived in a house in Clapham and, and they used to rent various rooms upstairs. And there was a Scottish couple who used to come downstairs every Christmas, wake me and my two sisters up, you know, because the three of us were the youngest. And we'd go outside in the back and we'd make this snowman and stuff, right? But they used to, play loads of Scottish music upstairs and I used to love it and then I started my dad liked jazz and I liked jazz my mom was into gospel I liked gospel so I started from very young I liked the Beatles the Yardbirds the Stones all of that kind of stuff was like you know number one band for me was the Kinks you know I loved the Kinks maybe that's why I'm talking about when we get into it like Paul maybe that's what drew me to Paul that whole kind of mod vibe Right, that the Kinks kind of like had, even though it was pre, you know, what Paul Weller and everybody mm-hmm. else was doing. It was like that whole thing of this will be the next wave, if you get what I'm saying. I just loved music. And by the time I got to 15, 16, I put a band together called Atlantis. We went out, we would do pubs and little clubs and stuff like this. And it was really interesting because of the fact that like you're 16, you're arrogant because you don't want to play nobody else's music. Your music's the best music, so you just want to do your thing. So you'd go out and you'd play places, and it would be such a laugh. We'd go out and we'd play these places, and and nobody would clap. And we'd have to get off the the stage and walk through the audience. You're walking through, and all of these people are looking at you, and then somebody touched you and said, like, that was good, you know, man. And then somebody else would touch you and say, that was good. And I was like, so why didn't you clap? You know what I'm saying? Like, why didn't you clap? It was all that experience of, of your first time doing this and, and going on stage, right? You've been singing in the house and you're having fun, but now you're on a stage. I remember the band going out, we played to two people, right? An hour, an hour long set. One guy dancing the whole night and the girl that he was with just like stood at the side of the stage and that was it. And that was our audience. And that's like, you know, 16, 17, you're having fun. Come on, you're, you're, you're learning, you're having fun, you're able to go all over the place in per, you know, different parts of the country and play. And it was that that really excited me, the whole thing of being able to play to people and have a laugh and, and see faces. And I just like that communication thing that we do. Yeah. And I got more and more involved in, in, in that side of things till I got to my early 20s. And then I think by the time I got to 21, I decided I didn't want to be in a band anymore. I wanted to learn more about studio stuff. So I had a friend who had a, a studio, so I'd go there. He was making an album and asked me if I would get involved in making this album with him. The first single was a song called Get Up and Dance, Hot Up and Heated. It's like a double A site. And it came out in France. It didn't come out in England and went to number one in the dance charts in France. But I didn't actually know this until two years later when I did Mama <laughs> Used to Stay and went to France. Yeah. Wow. To- <laughs> Incredible. That's amazing. That's amazing. Now, there's a couple of things I want to ask you about that. You as a kid doing these gigs and stuff. I mean, number one, did you have the moves then? Were we all ready to pop in and a pop in? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> they came later, fair enough. They came and, later. <laughs> and I was talking to um, Steve Brooks, who um, set up the jam with Paul Weller. But he said him and Weller, when they first started the jam, it was to get girls. The only point of it at their school <laughs> was to get girls. Was there any of that with you as well? Of course it was. What's wrong with you? <laughs> 
physically, I was like 16, 17, 18, that, all of that kind of age group. And you could go on stage and you could jump up and down and all of these girls would be astounded by it all. It was fantastic, mate, right? You know, <laughs> you get on stage and everybody's on you and you're the best thing since sliced bread. It was brilliant. <laughs> uh, brilliant, love it. And now we should dig into some of the connections with Paul Weller. Um, obviously, yeah. at this time, um, the jam uh, massive. What was your first connection with Paul Weller and his music? Would it have been the jam or would it have come in the Star Council? I think it would have come from the jam. I wasn't really, to be honest, it's like I wasn't really listening to what the jam was doing because at that time in, in Britain, it was more of a divide in terms of what you were listening to musically. So the jam came along when I'm listening to Bob Marley, if you get what I'm saying, right? So I'm not interested in the jam. I'd, I'd see Paul up there, I'd see the jam. But what I always liked was the energy and the urgency of the jam. And then I would hear one and two songs and I'd love the lyrical flow of the jam and and it was you know when you start kind of like i'd really like to meet that guy one day do you know because it's yeah. just kind of in your head like the way he constructs the songs and stuff and was it a bit um oh what was the one that really got me up it was like a bit of pill i think it was and that kind of really grabbed me what he was saying in that song just really grabbed me and i thought wait a minute you know, you sit back and kind of like, wait a minute, this guy's actually talking to a whole generation here. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't like he was just a good writer. It yeah. was he was a part of a generation and a part of a movement through that generation at that time that he was talking to them. He was talking to two kids his age, slightly older and younger, who could understand where he was coming from, what was going on in London at that time, what was going on in his head at that time, what he was seeing. He was like a sponge every time time you hear Paul it would be something different but it would be on point so you know from the the, the jam stuff to the, the style council stuff he was always it seemed to me just like experimenting having a good time with it doing it all in a different way but the, the gigs that he did where he came out and they, they'd open the gigs you know the things that he was challenging the borders that he was prepared to kick down I like that energy I always did and and for us to get together with Red Wedge which is where we started to have our relationship during that period of time that was a, a phone call from him basically saying this is what we want to do this was before making the record and everything it was Red Wedge was going to be about so myself Billy and Paul got together and had a chat about this thing and what we were trying to achieve at the time, which was, to be quite honest, very simply, we wanted young people to actually be aware of politics. We wanted young people not to be part of a Labour Party, Conservative Party, but to have these parties put their gumph on chairs so that young people could come, they could read. And my thing was, was that instead of trying to look at trying to affect central government, it was more about look to try and affect your MP or the person within your constituency and pile the pressure on them so that they have to make the change, i.e. they have to go to central government, they have to fight for you. But we could only do that as a collective. And that was the first time for me with the, the whole mindset of being a collective coming from different parts of this island and being able to talk from different perspectives but when you nail it all down we're all saying the same thing you know just to add different respective audiences we'll get on to Red Wedge because I think it's a it's a remarkable period in music and I know that Paul's not always looked on, back on it unfavorably but actually the, there were some remarkable things to come of that in terms of change you talked about the jam and, and lyrics as a mm. songwriter Paul's talked about uh, uh, songs such as that's entertainment taking him 10 minutes um, am I right in thinking you mentioned Mama used to say earlier on, which, yeah. um, which was this amazing, massive, massive single that launched your career. Right. Didn't that take you like 10 minutes as well? Is that right? Yes, yeah, about that. It was uh, <laughs> wow. a chance meeting with this girl. I used to work in a heel bar and I was 23 and my mum used to always tell me about this whole thing about rushing to get old. You, you're 16, you want to be 18, you're 18, you want to be 21, you're 21, you want to be 25, you're 25, you want to be 30. You know, when it gets to about 27, you're not really pushing so hard to get to 30, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we, I'd met this young lady in the, the shop I worked in, started talking to her. I had turned and said to her that like, you know, I asked her her age and she said, she was 18 and I thought Christ if I tell her I'm 23 she's going to think I'm too old so I cut my age down to 20 and I got the date you know what I'm saying <laughs> I went it's crazy. I went back home to mum you know and I was telling my mum because I, I just found it so hilarious that like you know 
I've been pushing all these years to get to this age and now I'm here and I'm turning around and I'm cutting it already and I'm only 23. Yeah, yeah Mate, you're already over the hill. You know, <laughs> exactly. And that was my mum, you know. Mama used to say, take your time, young man. Don't you rush to get old. It was everything that she used to say to me. And so that song took, yeah, roughly around about 10 minutes to do. I was at the hill bar, stood up, sang the song, had the, the whole thing in my head and then that right. was it. Wow, wow. And it wasn't a hit immediately, was it? It took a bit of time. No, it, it came out the 22nd, no, the 27th of July, 1981. It came out because that was my sister's birthday. It did nothing. And I went on tour with Lynx towards the back end of the year, David Grant and Sketch Martin. I think it must have been in the December. We started getting these reports, you know, that like the record's like booming in America. But in America, what happens is, is in December, they stop the chart. So if you're in the chart in December or you're being played during that period of time, then right through the Christmas period, you're on heavy rotation. So, yeah. So <laughs> it, was like, it was crazy. Seriously crazy. I was on every, this heavy rotation during the winter and come around about February, March, I get told that like, you know, you sold 100,000 copies in New York, you sold 20,000 or 50,000 copies in Chicago, another 150. I couldn't, I couldn't fathom these figures, man. Do you know, it was like the record just blew up. And then it came back to England in the spring, I think it was, of 82 and became a huge hit. And then it went to Europe and did the same thing. And that was really the beginning of this mad period of life that I've been living for the last 40 years, which has been fantastic. I bet, I bet. And a song that you'll never get sick of performing, singing, because, no. I mean, it's a fabulous bloody song, isn't it? I mean, and the moves in the video as well. Wow, my friend. That's where they were busting out, wasn't it? <laughs> hey, we were, we were young. We were young and you try to put something down that's different and you don't want it to sound American but at the same time you want it to compete with American records you know I was stanch I'm, I'm English I'm not British in the sense that yes I'm part of the British Isles but I was born in England and there was things that were going on in South London where I came from that I wanted to reflect in what I was writing and how I saw things at that time as well so Mama was a great way for me to start because it was like a, a social aware song Let's be honest, you know, it's what most parents tell their children and we all continue to tell our children as we go along. Yeah, I think it was more that kind of, of, of song for me. It just took me to new heights and various different places and that can be the beauty of making music. Now, Paul's ditched the jam in 82. The Style Council is his new project fit pretty soon afterwards and we're into Cafe Blur and My Favourite Shop and all that. There's this spin-off called The Council Collective, which is this fundraising single, Soul Deep. And essentially it's the cast of The Style Council. So you've got Weller, you've got Mick Talbot, Steve White, DC Lee, Jimmy Ruffin, wow, Leonardo Chignoli from Animal Night Chignoli. Life, Dizzy Heights, the rapper, and we'll, and we'll get on to the rapping bit of that song in a sec as well, second as well. Um, Vaughn to lose and yourself. How did that song come about for you? I got a phone call from Paul. By this time, we'd been talking concerning Red Wedge. And uh, he rang me up and he said, I want to make this song for the miners. So obviously I was down with all of that because what we were doing. And um, I went in the studio and he came up with this track. And it was like, I don't really find this so full. I just find it energetic. Right. And that was the thing about it. There was so much energy and power in what we were saying and the way that the whole thing came across that like sometimes you listen to something the first time around and you can't get it. Sometimes you record it and you still can't get it. And then when you go on stage right, and you start doing it night after night. It clicks. Right? It just clicks. And I think that's what happened with Soul Deep was the fact that we all were a bit iffy about it. Maybe Paul was totally confident, but I think everybody else was a bit iffy because it was different. It wasn't like a soul record. It wasn't a pop record. It was a council collective record. It was all of these different mindsets thrown into this little pot and stirred around, you know, right? And, and what we came up with, I think it was a great little record. You know what I mean? It was really good. And, and being able to sing it, to do it, it's one of those where unless you actually know that person's career, you never ask about it. So a lot of people don't even know. That, you know, sometimes I would turn and say about doing Soul Deep and people would be like, you worked with Paul Weller? It's like, yeah. Billy Braggs? Yeah. Tom Robinson? Yeah. 
nah, you're lying. I'm telling you the truth. <laughs> you know, it's one of them. It's like, you know, it's like, why would you go from soul music to making that kind of music? And I'm like, you're not getting it. Where I come from, good music stands. I don't have this whole thing of it's rock and roll or it's pop or these are labels given to our music. It's a way of trying to sell the music into the marketplace. And I totally get that. I wanted to be involved in things that I felt that were honest and that were true and that were reflective of our country, not what was going on outside of our country. And that's what, as I said, that was the thing that I loved about what Paul did and what I believe is the same. As artists, they talk about where they're coming from. They're not fantasizing it. They're living it. They're exposed to it. And they're able through poetry, because most of them are great poets, they're able to capture something and put it out there. And it just spreads like wildfire because it has so many connotations that you can take from it. You know, and that's to me what Paul did with Soul Deep. I know, you know, there were clubs, black clubs that would not play that kind of music, but was playing it because of what it was saying. Oh, wow, really? Wow. Yeah. And that was like, for me, that was like top notch for me. You know, we would go up north through the Red Wedge period. Say if we went to Blackburn, it's like the whole of the Asian community was behind what we were doing. You know, and if we went into Leicester and Birmingham, Coventry, the whole of the black community would be into what we were doing. And then if we went out a bit further and we went to York and we went to places like that, and further, like Newcastle and all of that, well, white people would be on board. So we were coming from being able to cut right across our demographic in terms terms of young people you know that's still one of the outstanding things i think that we achieved during that period of time being able to cut right through there's a lovely quote from billy bragg saying about well i'll read it to you i think the guy i was most pleased to see on the bus was junior because he was the one with the most to lose musically and socially he came from a different background than the rest of us so it's great that he came and I think it was the fact that, you know, this is a big risk for you, Red Wedge, really, because, you know, you were the right. one with the full like, mainstream pop career um, and people tried to talk you out of it as well, didn't they? Yeah, we had loads of people, even my co-writer, Bob, he tried to talk me out of it. The record company tried to talk me out of it. Pretty much everybody. They just didn't see it. And they, they all thought that, like, you know, you're going to kill your career because you're seen as a pop artist. Your records have been popular and you're mainstream. And if you do this, it's going to make it very difficult for you and stuff. I was like, hell, you know, I'm coming from around the corner from Brixton. Do you get what I'm saying? It's been hell for years. So a bit more hell didn't really bother me. You know what I'm saying? You know, it's a bit like because of the success of the record, people felt that like and because... I came from Clapham and it's very conservative. It was um, very white. It was all of these things that were going on in Britain at the time. And I was being a part of this thing. Even, you know, there was some black parts of, you know, black people didn't really check for me doing it. Felt that I didn't need to do it. Then there was white people who felt that, like, was he trying to jump on the Paul Weller bandwagon for? And then you, you get what I'm saying? It yeah, was like yeah. you were getting it in the neck from everywhere. But as I said, for me, what it was, was that, like, I also took that as something to spur me on. It wasn't something that was holding me back. You would see, you know, some of the, the critics would be really harsh. And yeah, you know, you're young and, and you're angry and you're pissed and you're involved in something whereby you're not sure whether the other members in it would cover you in the way that you are covering them by being there. It was really interesting during that period of time because, as I said, nobody truly wanted to back me. Everybody was against the fact that you were coming into this whole thing. You were a part of the beginnings of this whole thing where you were coming from was totally left the centre to everybody else. At least that's what it seemed like. Yeah. And I guess there's also you know, not just being a young man, but being a young black man where the view is, the perception mm. is that you're not capable of talking about these issues, I'm guessing. No, you, who am I? I mean, you, what do you know? You, you know, it was that kind of thing. It was, all right, a classic would be the Rock and Pop Awards was coming up and I was being invited to the Rock and Pop Awards by the record company. I've got a record that I'm going to put out and it was too late at the time, which was the second single. So I turned and I said to the record company, the exec there, and I turned and I said, you know what? If you're not doing anything on the weekend, come with me. We'll go down to Brixton. We'll go down and we'll go and listen to Mystery so that you can hear that track being played, how the audience right, are going to go for it. It gives you a better idea of who it is that buys junior records in London because we were in London. So I said, it would give you a better idea and when you go back to market right you know with your marketeers you will have gone into a different scene to actually experience something different 
guy at a record company looked at me and started laughing and said to me, you must be mad. What, you think I'm going to come down to Brixton, right, and go to a blues party? So I turned and I said to him, so why do you feel that I need to be at your rock and pop awards? It's got nothing to do with me, right? It's got nothing at all to do with me. I will end up being maybe one of five in a, in a room of maybe two and a half thousand. So you explain to me why that makes sense. It's good for your career. And I never went. I was like, to hell with you. I ain't bothered with that. Right. Because as I said, it was like I was about trying to make things inclusive. And what you were doing was saying that you were a, you wanted to be a part of that, be inclusive. But in reality, you still wanted divide and rule. Yeah. And that was one of the things that really pushed me into Red Wedge as well. The mere fact that like you all feel that I don't have a voice and it's not just me, but other black people. We don't have a voice. So I should have looked at it that I was so fortunate to be a part of when the reality was that no, I didn't see myself as being fortunate to be a part of because to me, and at that time, we were all pretty much submerged into being one. We did Liverpool and they were chatting racist things on stage and I stopped the show and I, I was like, hold on a minute, this is supposed to be about all of us coming together. How come I've got racists inside here? What's going on? Do you know? Wow. That's what was happening on the tour. You'd get the hecklers, you'd get the, the chance of colour this and colour that, and black this and whatever else. And again, it, it threw me because, again, as I said, the whole thing was to bring people together, get them working together in their own areas to pile pressure on the mayor of various different cities and whatever else to get change for young people and to put young people on a path whereby they could truly establish themselves in, in this commercial marketplace that Margaret Thatcher had devised for young people. You know, it was a real deceiving movement that she did during that period of time. And it wasn't just to black kids as much as TV and everybody else wants to show that because that's a great narrative to show. But if you go up to where we were going, which was Middlesbrough and Newcastle and all of these places, which was primarily white. And because of the minor strike, people who had had generational work no longer had any work. Then the rhetoric in terms of immigration that Margaret Thatcher kept on, right, as an, an underlying play that she could always draw that card out whenever she wanted. And it was like going around and seeing that so many people were falling for it and weren't fighting back. And Red Wedge was a truly, if we really nailed it, it was about fighting back. It was about taking looking and saying, you know what, I'm not a politician, but I need to understand politics, right? Not politics, but politics. And I need to understand that so that I'm not fooled by mass media's way of projecting blackness, projecting interracial business. The media has its own way of ensuring that they can divide people and not allow them to come together because if they do come together and they do forge as one, it's a problem. And well and, and listening to you talk then, you kind of feel like I hope that We've come some way in the past 30 years. I can see, you know, things have changed, but a lot of what you talk about then, you can still see a lot of that happening, right? Yeah. The lyrics of Soul Deep talking around solidarity, you feel that that's, um, that that's floods through with Red Wedge, um, not least in Paul and B, actually, because that was when yeah. they got together romantically. Weren't they, they just snogging together. the entire time, weren't they? <laughs> <laughs> on the bus, mate, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. And you got to perform that song on Top of the Pops, which must have been a delight. Paul did the rapping bits as well, which I referred to earlier on. Yeah. But Red Wedge, Paul's been described as the soul of Red Wedge and financed that first tour. And this idea that kind of everybody left their egos at the door, everybody mucked in. It's an amazing lineup like Jerry Dammers and Billy Bragg, Gary Kemp, Jimmy Somerville, you, Anna Joy David at the heart of it. So you also did these amazing day events as well, which um, Daniel Rachel was a guest on the show um, and was talking about these incredible, these real grassroots events, which was, I mean, yeah. just remarkable. You can't imagine this, can you? This is what I'm saying. If you, if you think about it, in today's society, right, that we managed to go out and we would sit down and we would we would have these Q and A's with young people. It was one of these things where you were learning. I was learning so much about other people's areas, what was taking place, the abuse that the police gave a load of those minors during that period of time, you know, the things that were going on that people weren't reporting and weren't hearing, police going and smashing down people's doors and taking husbands out and, and all this kind of stuff. I mean, really going right back to the, like the war and stuff like that in terms of the way that people were treated and the way that they were also seen 
it was incredible. Those things that we used to do in the day when we'd get to Bradford or wherever we were going and we'd do a Q&A like class during the day and then we'd do the gig at night. We'd get taken around. We'd get to see various just ordinary people, what their lives were like. You know, some people, because of what was going on during that time, they were living in schools. Schools had opened up for people to be in schools, you know, families. It was just incredible. Mad, it, yeah. It was. It was incredible, man. You, you know, now that we're sitting here and we're chatting about it, because I don't really, you know, go into it, but it's like now sitting down and chatting about it and thinking about what we, we actually achieved. You know, we actually managed to do that as a bunch of young men with ideals and and strength for depth for characters and all that. Yeah, it was amazing. Yeah. And some big concerts as well. There were others who were kind of other benefit gigs as well around that time that the Style Council did. There's like Hyde Park, October 85, Human Race or Nuclear Race was the gig. It was Paul, Steve White, Mick wasn't there. So it's Paul, Steve White, this super groups kind of formed. Um, Gil Scott Heron, Billy Bragg, Communards and you. I mean, wow, blimey, what a lineup. (laughs) That was free, it was free, wasn't it? It was a free gig. It was huge right? in terms of the amount of people that came out. It was fantastic, man. Like Hundred thousand you know. people. Is that, that's nice. right. <laughs> Wow, I mean, and did, can you remember what you did? Can you remember? Was did you do solo stuff? Did you play with a sing with we a did, band? How did it work? We did two tracks, if I remember correctly. We did um, did Soul Deep, and we did um, oh, what was the other one? The Curtis Mayfield song. Oh, okay, right, that's it. Oh God, move on up, move on up. So we did those two and just smashed it. <laughs> I remember, but yeah, we did. We smashed it, mate. Right, <laughs> it's <was> brilliant. <laughs> Incredible, absolutely incredible. And you also joined the Style Council on tour actually, later that year. Um, the Style Council um, on tour, we've seen it. Wembley Showbiz was the, the nights and three nights right. at Wembley. They had this amazing string section as part of the band as well. But you guessed well, it on the Wembley nights too, didn't you? That's right. Right. You know, Paul rang me up and said to me, listen, you got to come down. And I'm like, come down where? We're doing Wembley. Like, yeah, I want you to come on stage. I want you to sing. <laughs> like, what? Like, yeah. <laughs> so I did the three nights, I think it was, and went down and did move on up each night with them. And that was just, that was awesome, man. That was awesome. Awesome. Yeah, I bet. Yeah, that I was bet. A- and what was it about the band, the, the Star Council, that was such a magical thing to be part of and be you know, in the mix of those people? I think what it was was the, the, the characters of the people. There was no airs and graces. There's nobody, nobody was above anybody. Everybody was very open, very warm. Everybody was respectful. You were enlightened, I would say, by being around Right, some of the other characters that were there. Tom Robinson was for me like phenomenal, just phenomenal. Is so there somebody to sit talk to who was going through what he was going through at that time as well? Because remember, you know, the whole thing of being gay and the way that he was being perceived and stuff. And and you truly have started to understand empathy for people. And that was another thing that Red Wedge did because there was just myself and a girl singer, um, Lorna G, who was black, and she was it was just the two of us involved so we got a lot of flack from the press when it came to the actual gigs the press wouldn't talk about everybody else but wouldn't talk about us and it was the bands this is just to show you how it was it was the various bands that would turn around and start making a noise about it no this isn't fair that kind of thing how is it that like he would get the most in terms of the audience participation and we wouldn't get as much as he's gotten but nobody's talking about him we'd get a one liner whereas everybody else would get a huge paragraph and whatever else again it made you thick skin too because you realised that like you weren't dealing with people who were going to be fair honest give you a good crack at a whip so that you could show what you're doing you know you were dealing with people who didn't want you to be a part of this Red Wedge thing didn't want you to be friends with a Billy Bragg or friends with a Paul Weller and actively were trying to sever that. That was what was interesting, the camaraderie between us staying close and them backing me. And you mentioned about Paul giving you a ring then for the Wembley gigs. By then you're a Grammy Award winner, aren't you? (laughs) Yeah, by that time. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So this is the album Beverly Hills Cop, this massive movie, Eddie Murphy, which would have been, what, tail end of 84, I think. And then the uh, the album comes out a little later. And it's one of those ones where it goes in the charts and then eventually like after six months climbs to number one which is crazy I remember getting that out on video right begging my family to get that on video and I would have been I'd have been too young to see it 
Um, so, so we eventually got out of the video shop and we watched the first 10 minutes and and, Ed, and the first 10 minutes, if you ever watch those again, it's just basically Eddie Murphy giving it MF this <laughs> yeah. all the way like, for 15 minutes. And I was like finding it funny as like a 13 year old kid. And my dad went ballistic. Ballistic. <laughs> Absolutely ballistic. This is not funny and turned it off and I didn't get to watch it. We took it back to the no. video shop, but he went mental about it. Amazing song on the soundtrack. Do you really open brackets, want my love, close brackets, tell me about that fabulous song got Stevie Wonder on it as well right yeah Stevie Wonder plays drums on it as well I'd been in America and I'd been on tour and Eddie Murphy was staying in the room below so I used to turn the speakers up and I mean turn the music up and blare it out blast it and I mean I was expecting to get people knocking the door and you know complaining and stuff I got no complaints I did this for three days constantly nothing stamping on the floor banging I'm singing out loud I'm out of tune I'm doing the whole bit Nothing. So I thought, all right, that's it. I'm not having this. So the day that I was going to leave, I think it's the fourth day, I took a copy of the album and I pushed it underneath his door. I left, I went to New York, spent a couple of days in New York and then came back to England. When I got back to England, I got a phone call from a record company saying that, Junior, there's some guy called Eddie Murphy who's making a movie and he's asked if you can write a song for it. Wow. And I just cracked up laughing because I knew that the record company didn't know who Eddie Murphy was <laughs> at that time. So uh, I had what, two days, another one of those 10 minute jobs. I had um, two days to put the whole thing together. So it, I used to have a, a, an eight track Fostex way back in the day and a Juno keyboard right, and a Lindrum. And I did everything at home. My dad was a carpenter and my dad like, he, he kind of like um, soundproofed the bedroom for me and stuff so I could make as much noise as I wanted to. I wrote that song and played that song at home, got in a guy called Glenn Nightingale to play guitar on it. And I sent it over, sent it back to the record company, who sent it to Paramount. And the next thing I know is that the cassette that we did was in the film. They used a minute and 30 seconds. It's like the longest piece of music in the film away from Axel F. So I was like ecstatic. You know, this is Eddie Murphy. He's asked for it. I've given him a cassette. I've gone to the record company and I'm saying, right, we've got to make the record. And they're saying, yeah, but the cassette's in the movie. I'm like, what are you talking about? It's like, yeah, they're using the cassette version in the movie. So I thought, uh, I can't believe this, but I, it, you're still kind of bubbling and all over the place. And then Stevie Wonder came into England and I'd met him prior. 1982 I think it was I met Stevie and so when he came in I thought I'm going to be cheeky and ask him you know because I know he's never ever done a drum session right so I'm like I'm going to be cheeky and I'm going to ask him if he'd do a drum session and he said yes and he wow. came down it's classic he came down and he was playing drums and do you really want my love and there is a lick that I do vocally that is a Stevie Wonder lick and as soon as he heard it he, he fell back and we thought oh my god he's going to fall off the chair and everything so we all rushed in the studio and when we rushed in the studio he couldn't stop laughing and he said, you stole that from me. I stole that from Clyde McFadden. Clyde McFadden. He told me the whole history of this one lick. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> and I should say also, actually, thinking of, whilst I think of it, um, I think you would have been one of the first people I ever saw in concert. My first concert live was Michael Jackson Bad, 1987, <sighs> and Kim Wilde supported. And weren't you part of that mix? That's correct. That's correct. I I um I did a track with Kim Wilde called Another Step, and we had a huge hit with this record. And and um we got a phone call from the MD at MCA, and he said to me that Michael Jackson's you know the tour's coming, and Junior, we want you on the tour. You know, we want you to go out with Kim and do what you do, and blah blah. And I was like, this would be amazing, Michael Jackson. And then you started. We went to Aintree. And it was like 120,000 people. It was just like a sea of people. I'd never seen anything like that, you know, before. You know, even though when we did the Red Wedge and it's like 100, but this was like a sea of people. Kim and I came off stage and we must have walked for it. It seemed like a mile. Yeah. Walking back and it's still there's a sea of people. It was fantastic. And we did that, all the Wembley dates. I've got a chance to meet him, Michael Jackson. He, uh turned around and knocked the, the the room and wanted to meet me, sent over his people, wanted to meet me. So we were there and I got a chance to talk to him and he was telling me about the fact that um, Janet Jackson had showed him a video of Mummy he used to say. And he said to me, and I stole some of your moves, man. You know, I put him in, what is it, Thriller, I think he said. It's, I was like, you know, you laugh. You know, he's standing there. He's like, he's saying, this is honest. Like, this, Michael Jackson reckoned that my moves, he stole my moves. I'm looking at the video and I'm saying, I can't see none of my moves in there. What did you do? 
<laughs> yeah, that would have been my first concert. That's so funny. Yeah. I remember it for three things. Obviously, the Jacko thing, I was a massive Michael Jackson fan. I had plasters around my fingers and everything. Oh, you did all of that. Did all the bad stuff. Yeah. I remember Kim Wilde falling out of her top. That, that happened on that <laughs> night. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And I remember it starting and some guy running from the back of the, st- he'd obviously gone to get a drink or for a wheel or whatever. And it just started right. and he ran and he slipped over and the entire stadium went, Way! and he got up and did a bow. <laughs> <laughs> Those are my, my main memories of that. But yeah, um, Brilliant. we have to talk about um, back from lockdown, back performing live again, new album as well. So 2021, obviously for musicians, singers, songwriters, it's been pretty awful the past couple of years, but you're back on stage, back performing again. And there's a brand new album. Tell me about that. Right. Let's start with a brand new album, brand new album is called Everything Set right I've gone to Jamaica and I made this album I decided that I wanted to do an album which was songs of mine which had been successful around the world but do them in a reggae style and do them as duets now the the whole concept of this was my daughter's who unfortunately passed before we finished the project but it was her idea of doing this and I I mean she'd been on my case for years about doing it and I'd be like oh please Janique leave it alone I'm not interested it's uh, yeah I know I come from the reggae sound and this that and the other but and it went on and it went on and it went on and I took her to Jamaica we all went down to Jamaica with a family and a cousin of mine said that like you should hook up with Luciana so I thought yeah all right so he set it up we hooked up went in the studio and we cut a version of Mama used to say and it just started from there it was like I'd pick up the phone and I'd, I'd said to Tabby Diamond from the Mighty Diamonds I'd like him to do a track Bosh we were in the studio Stephen Marley Bosh we are in the studio Janet Kay Carol oh, Janet Kay I mean that's love that version of uh, Morning Will Come with Janet Kay I mean she, I mean, she's fabulous isn't she but she's yeah, fantastic. she is fantastic it was like picking up the phone and just calling everybody and everybody came on board because it was like they had heard about Janique they knew the kind of person that she was and it was just one of the best projects I've ever been involved in to be quite honest with you you know that you can can hear that album at my from my website which is juniorgiscom.co.uk I went on from that and and we started doing writing I started doing a lot of writing so I wrote with a, a French band called AP Connection and they put the record out and they've just had a top 10 I think it is in France and then I'd been asked to do an album with a load of other 80s artists called Rediscovered the first single is a track with Sunita and Kim Mazel that we've done called Can You Feel It do you remember the old Jackson song? Oh, yeah yeah Can yeah brilliant wow brilliant we've just done that we've just done that and that's beginning to get played and stuff like that and on the album itself we were all to choose a song that was like one of those songs that inspired us all and made us all want to you know get into music and stuff like that and I chose Love's In Need Of Love today because it was like what was being said 40 years ago is still relevant today in terms of we need to heal a lot and I think we need to hear something like that so that we all kind of understand that we need to heal. We're going through a bad time, to be honest, on every level. And I think that we just need some kind of healing and we need to hear some songs, which as much as they're energetic and very fired up and stuff, but some songs that kind of like melancholy, then let's say, can sit back and like in the same way as a Marvin Gaye would have done, what's going on, I want you, that kind of thing. I wanted to try and do something like that. So we did that song and it's turned out pretty well. So I'm well happy. And uh, going out and doing shows, I was in Birmingham yesterday down at the Jam House in Birmingham. We sold that out. So that was fantastic. And again, seeing people smiling, shouting back at you for songs, you know, that maybe I hadn't put into the actual thing, the actual, you know, rundown of songs that we're going to do and people being upset because you didn't sing Morning Will Come or you didn't sing Oh Louise. Or you, and you're there and you're thinking like, yeah, oh, listen, I'm, I'm really sorry. I, I'll make sure next time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've forgotten like, those ones. <laughs> I've forgotten a long time. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. And tell me about the British Collective as well. So this is you, Donny, Noel McCoy and Omar. And Omar's That's working correct. with with Paul Weller at the minute, I think, isn't he? Right. They've just done some stuff together as well. He's got on, which would be out on his new album. Right. Omar's new album. But again, Omar's known Paul. I think Omar was a dancer for Paul back in the day. They, on stage with the Star Council way back in the day when they had people come up and dance and Omar was one of them so they have a history too in terms of you know Paul gave him his first his first chance his first shot it's funny how things come all the way around we decided to put like this band together because it was like there was nothing like 
that in the UK for various different R&B artists who had been successful in their own right were coming together to do this thing but it wasn't going to be like all right we're going to do some dancing and showman thing and this that and the other it truly is like four individual artists coming together and just having a ball on stage you know a bit like what George Harrison did back in the day when he put the whole thing together, right? Travelling Wilburys. Yeah, uh, the super group, Travelling Wilburys, yeah. Remember that? Well, it was that kind of mindset. You know, Donny was like, I'm doing a track on this album and I want all of you guys to sing on it. So I went down, sang on it, called Lee John, Lee John then called Carl McIntosh, Carl McIntosh then called Paul Johnson. And it just went on like that. Again, it was more of like a family vibe, a really cool vibe and, and it worked. And when we heard the record and we heard what we did vote Locally together, it was like, this would be really nice, you know, if we actually took this out and showed the kids that they, you know, these are things that they can, they can do. They're all individual, but they can all come together and make records together and try and change things and put things out there for their audiences to be listening to opposed to my postcode is this and your postcode is that. You know, it was mm-hmm. like, we can actually try and show something here. We, we, we're in that position. Yeah. We can do this. And we started Five years ago, put an album out, British Collective Anthology, Volume 1, and that did pretty well for us, and it started from there. It's just like, and then when the whole thing with COVID came around and we couldn't work together, but we could still get on the phone and talk about music and talk about stuff. And now that we're back together and we've been doing dates together and stuff, it just seems like, you know, when you've got a great friend and you haven't seen him for years, but when you see him, it's just like, you know, we were talking yesterday, that kind of thing. It was brilliant. Yeah, love it. Love it. And then back to that message of solidarity again, right? It's, um, it's, yeah. it's all full circle, all linked, isn't it? And, and what's the, been the connections with Paul since Red Wedge? Have you met each other, we, worked with each other, chatted at all? Yeah, we, we chatted. Oh God, we're going back a bit now because I think he must have just come off. Of, he was on tour in Japan. This is a good few years ago. The last time we met up, we were at some club or the other, and and I was getting legless as per usual. <laughs> <laughs> Busting out the moves again. <laughs> you know, kicking the moves, mate. <laughs> Killing the moves. But I think it was him that put me in a cab and sent me home with me. <laughs> brilliant. brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. What have you made of the music from Mr. Weller recently? I think I think that he's going through that transition, you know, where you, you've grown up. I think what it is for me, right, is that Paul is still experimenting. Paul is still finding... Paul, I know that sounds a bit strange maybe, but each cycle of Paul is where he's found himself and then he gets bored and then he moves on to the next cycle of Paul. And once he's found it, he's bored. But his writing just keeps getting better and better and better. It's a wealth of music there from Paul, just a wealth of great music. And as I said, because he was that guy, he was that person at that time, right, who had a whole young generation jumping up and down and understanding everything that he was saying they were living it you know and that, that to me I want to go and see Paul lovely. simple thanks this has been so lovely I have to say when you, when you say about going from strength to strength with Paul the same is true of yourself I mean your voice sounds richer than ever my friend it's, it's a beautiful thank thing. you very much wow. no, honestly ma- amazing um, I've got two final questions for you um, this is the Paul Weller fan podcast so you're allowed one Paul Weller song for the rest of your life it can be the jam the style council or solo which one you're gonna pick no matter what i do i still can that's my track (laughs) i want you to do the rest (laughs) that's my track ever changing moves (laughs) ever changing moves that's a beautiful song right great song man great song so yeah style council good one good one and a purpose of this podcast is not least to talk to amazing people like yourself who have met or collaborated or the fans of paul weller all, all three but it's also to for me to get that interview with paul weller that i never managed during my radio career if it happens what should i ask him no <laughs> is there anything you want to know or anything you reckon i should oh, bring up <laughs> well what would i want to know what would i want to know what would i want to know i'd actually like to know what it was that made him break up with style council but then i saw a documentary and talbot was talking about the fact of that whole thing and it was like again coming to the end of that cycle right, of doing it in a particular way and now I just want to do something else and, and he's a typical Gemini and that's what I like because I'm a Gemini right? but, but he's a typical Gemini right, Paul, you know it, it's I can do this and I can do this well and once I've done it 
right? People would say like, oh, you should stay on that. And it's like, hell no, I'm on to the next thing. And that's, I think what's happened with his music is on to the next thing. And I, I just want to see him on this next journey. I think he's a great artist and always will do. Right? And I just think that, you know, it'd be lovely to see him now at this stage in his life is the kids with the family mentality that's now come into play, you know, as much as going out on the road we all love we've all grown into being good fathers I hope and bringing up these lovely wonderful kids that we all have so I'd like to see him now at that stage in his life because now he's calmer he's a lot more easier right you know he's still got that edge when he does his conversations and stuff when he's doing his interviews and stuff and that's why I love him he's not lost the essence of Paul Weller this has been so lovely Junior thank you so much for joining me my friend I've loved every second of this really appreciate it it's been an absolute pleasure Pleasure, man. Thank you very much. Anytime. My thanks once again to Junior Giscombe. What a hugely passionate man. And I loved hearing about the creation of his music and those Red Wedge days. If you've enjoyed this episode of the podcast, please share on your social media channels and help to spread the word. Get in touch on Twitter at WellerFanPod or on Instagram and Facebook Paul Weller Fan Podcast. Head to my website to find more information on Junior with links to his music and videos with the Council Collective and the story behind his new album. You can also buy our exclusive pin badges and if you'd like to buy me a virtual coffee, that will be lovely as well. Just go to paulwellerfanpodcast.com. See you next time.